Good morning, everyone. It looks like folks are still actively joining. We're at about 55, 56. If you all can bear with us, we'd like to give maybe another minute or two and we will get started. Sam and Charlie are here and they're ready to go and ready to answer your questions on Roadmap to Wealth. But give us like two minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandra Delancey. Uh, I am the moderator for today's webinar. We've muted your audio, but we will offer ample opportunities to ask questions. So if you have any questions for the presenters, please send them to me using the question feature of GoToWebinar. It looks very different depending on you know what platform you're using to connect, but if you poke around and go to webinar, you should be able to find a questions feature. Uh, the presenters have also made today's slides available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar, so you will be, will be able to have access to the, um, to the slides. I am excited to present two of DMV's real estate leaders, Sam Jacknan and Charlie Einsman, who are both partners, business partners at Clear Sky Financial LLC. Today, they will be presenting the second webinar in the real estate investing series entitled Roadmap to Wealth. In today's webinar, Sam and Charlie will discuss the current state of the real estate market in the DMV. They will also discuss the roadmap to wealth, which is why you're here, and describe the three real estate investor profiles that will allow you to realize your real estate investing goals. Sam and Charlie are making themselves available after the webinar in case there are additional questions. So we want you to ask questions throughout the session. If there are questions that they haven't answered, they will stay on after the webinar to answer those questions. Um, Charlie Einsman has more than 20 years of real estate experience and is particularly skilled in structuring and negotiating win-win solutions for distressed sales. Along with Sam Jacknan, Charlie co-founded Clear Sky Properties LLC in 2005 and then Clear Sky Financial LLC in 2013. Sam Jackman has more than 25 years of experience in a broad range of real estate endeavors, particularly with distressed property sales and development. He primarily takes the lead for loan closings and administrative duties, duties for Clear Sky Financial, while he and Charlie collaborate on prospective deals. With no further introductions, I'm going to let Tam, um, Sam take it away. Thanks, Sandra, and thanks everybody for joining us. So this format's gonna be a little different. We'd like you to ask questions interactively as we go through it, as Sandra mentioned. and. I'm going to start off with a quick overview of what's been happening to us in the last couple of weeks since the webinar in the marketplace. So we have seen an extremely active marketplace. Uh, we both in the hard money line of business we're in and in our flipping uh, business. So let's start with the hard money line of business. What's going on there? We've seen uh, a, a complete change in the marketplace and available uh, capital. A bunch of the our competitors in the space had money coming from Wall Street. They just completely shut down lending, and a lot of their clients have come our way asking us uh, if they can do deals with us. And we're looking at all kinds of, of new clients and new transactions and new deals. The pipeline of uh, deal flow is just enormous. So it, it creates on the front end, especially for Charlie. What's going on is all these people are making inquiries. We have to evaluate every de deal in detail and provide feedback and see if they still make sense in this new marketplace. A lot of people are putting a little more money down. Uh, they're willing to move forward and, and uh, get things going. So that leads us to our flip business. What's going on for sellers is that there's virtually no inventory. And so even though the buyer market, as I'm sure you've read in the newspaper, is, is down dramatically, the number of transactions is down dramatically, what we're seeing is uh, the number of, of listings is actually down even more than the number of buyers. So there's a lot of demand. If you have a property to put on the market, you just get it on the market. Now's a great time because uh, everything we have has been picked up uh, with almost immediacy. Last weekend, we put one on Friday 
we had the same, the, with the same weekend we had it sold a uh, great house uh, in Woodbridge we've got other houses coming on the market and they're just moving as fast as we put them out there so we've seen a lot of that going on um, thinking more um, about flipping we've seen uh, more availability of contractor labor we're able to get multiple quotes we're able to get work done a lot faster the difficulty is is permitted work is going much much slower inspections are much slower any government approval is in incredibly slow so and the title companies are also really moving sluggishly on transactions because they're not getting title reports back quickly and because in general people are in except uh have difficulty signing physical documents uh, even with remote notary closings so we're seeing uh, transactionally, the transactions are there, but the process behind them is is mucked up a bit from this COVID. Charlie, what are you thinking? What do you see out there? All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about are uh, a couple of things. I will focus on the residential side, uh, do a little bit on that. And then I'm also going to focus on the commercial side, because I think some of you attendees are probably in the commercial space as well. So I'll briefly touch on that at, at the end of this little mini presentation. Uh, the first side of things that I wanna talk about is in the residential space. Uh, so I'll go over three subcategories within the residential space of which we all have business lines. Uh, so I'll start with the fix and flip space. I'll then talk about the uh, buy and hold space, which is our rental portfolio. And then I'll go over the uh, hard money space. Uh, now in the fix and flip space, especially for entry level properties, we are go we are undergoing what I consider the perfect storm. Uh, the perfect storm being uh, there's no inventory on the market. Once once the property is popped on the MLS, it flies off the market um, because of the the lack of inventory. Uh, we were looking at numbers in Prince William and, and Fairfax and Arlington, Alexandria, comparing the active listings from this year to last year, and we're 25% less. So for example, if there were 2,000 listings last year in Fairfax, we only have about 500 active listings today. So the inventory is really low. So that's perfect storm category number one. Number two, the second part of the perfect storm is that the, the renovation prices are coming down. Labor's cheaper, materials are cheaper. So we're seeing, a reno we're seeing a drop in our renovation costs and we're taking advantage of that. Um, the other thing that we're starting to see, um, uh, which is kind of good and bad, the bad part of it is that inventory is a little bit lower on the buy side, and that's because um, foreclosures are down. Uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, they've put an absolute two month, three month hiatus on foreclosures. I'm starting to see some come back end of June. So that's sort of compressed the inventory for you to purchase a little bit. Also though, what I'm starting to see on the positive side for you guys actively buying is that the out-of-towners that own real estate are starting to get really, really anxious. So if somebody lives in Florida and they've owned a couple of rentals, let's say in this area for a long time, uh, we're starting to see a lot of anxiousness amongst them. And the reason why we know this is because we focus on out-of-town owners, you know, with postcard campaigns and that kind of thing. And we're getting a lot more calls than we would have normally gotten in one of our campaigns. So, so those three things sort of make up the perfect storm in the fix and flip space. Now, the bad thing that's going on in the fix and flip space is that once a house is under contract, it is taking forever to get that property closed. So we obviously like back in the day, let's say January, February, pre-COVID, we were seeing deals closed between 25 and 35 days. Now we're seeing a 30 day close pushed out to 45. But the other thing that's going on is that the underwriters within the normal mortgage environment are really scrutinizing the borrowers kind of like the last day so if a mortgage company was going to do what's called a voe a verification of employment they'll do the normal voe right when the process starts to buy the house once it's under contract and then what they're doing is they're doing the voe sometimes 24 hours before closing to make sure that that borrower still has that job um, and so what's happening is is we're seeing some of the properties going under contract popping back out into the active status. So that's what's going on. So that's kind of the negative thing within the fix and flip space. Um, the next thing I wanna cover in the residential space is the buy and hold space, which is 
the residential, those holding residential rental portfolios. And so I want to cover two things. I want to cover the rental paybacks and the new rentals on how we're approaching that. Um, for our portfolio, our rental paybacks in April was fairly normal. Um, we had about a 95 to 97 and a half percent rent flow within all of our residential rentals. Um, but May was a little bit down. I think May was about 92 and a half percent. So we dropped a little bit, but for the most part, all of our rentals are very, very consistent. So we're doing pretty good on our, on our monthly rental paybacks for us. Um, and the reason for that is, is that we don't carry too many bottom of the line entry level properties. Uh, our properties consist of the next step up, uh, the townhouses that maybe are three levels, three and a half baths, built between 2000 and 2006. So we don't have the actual entry level rental product. You know, an entry level product might be a two level townhouse that was built in the 1950s. That's a really old product with lower rent. So that's probably why our rental rate on the rental paybacks is a little bit probably more robust than a normal than somebody else who's holding a lot of properties. Um, and the other thing too is most of our renters have government jobs or they have technology jobs. So they're fairly stable in this, in this economy. Um, the next thing I wanna cover is what are we doing as far as new rentals? Um, we have purchased new rentals in the past month, month and a half, and we do have a couple of rentals on the market. But one of the things that we're doing with our new rentals is that we're being very, very careful. Okay, so back in the day, we would take a rental application. Uh, we would obviously scrutinize their credit and their income, I mean, their income history and also income amounts. The thing that we're doing today is we're being a lot more careful on the type of jobs that these renters have. If they have uh, more service oriented jobs, jobs that we think they might get laid off in the next month or two, we are actually turning those applications down and we're waiting for a little bit more stable job type. Whereas, whereas in the past, we would have never scrutinized that. So we're focused on um, the job types that they have these days. And so we're being a little bit more conservative because we don't want somebody moving into our property and two, three weeks later, they get laid off. Um, that's a little risky for us and our entire rental portfolio. So like I said, we're sort of treading on the conservative side. The third part of the residential space that we're involved in that I want to cover is the hard money side. Sam has touched on some components of our hard money side. Uh, we are getting a lot more three put, throughput because our competitors are either on a lending hiatus or they, or they run out of money, or frankly, a couple of our competitors have actually gone out of business. So what's that done for us? Um, that's uh, we, we're having a huge throughput as far as new borrowers that are concerned, as well as our old borrowers. So that's uh, generating an avalanche of new business. And so we're sort of cutting ourselves through that. So you guys, if you have new stuff with us, just be a little bit patient with us. We are getting through it. Um, now, on the hard money space, I want to talk about our normal monthly loan paybacks. Uh, we are doing really, really well. Remember, our loan products are commercial loans. And so folks that are doing normal fix and flips have a little bit more disposable income. So they are making our monthly pay payments. And so that's pretty good and pretty healthy. Uh, we do have some stragglers out there. And so the folks that are not paying, they're pretty much letting us know why they're not paying. And so really what we're doing is we're just adding on uh, the monthly payments that they cannot make to the back end of the loan payback. So when they flip out of a property, we're just going to add that back on to the back part of the loan payments. And so that's going pretty well. Um, the next thing that's going on is existing sales. Uh, those folks that have fix and flips that are under contract are sort of running into the same problem that we're running into with the, with the fix and flip space and that their transactions are taking a lot longer to come to closure. So they have to be very careful. So if you're in a fix and flip, and you've got a property under contract, you have got to heavily lean on your realtor to get the job done. And more importantly, you've got to lean on the title company that's doing the work and the loan officer that's doing the work on behalf of that borrower. And you have got to get updates every two or three days. You cannot let things slide to day before closing where they come and tell you, uh oh, we're not closing tomorrow. Here's reason X, Y, and Z. You have got to stay on your process. And if you see something wrong at the very beginning of that process, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to get out of that uh, contract, put your property back on the market and get a buyer that's gonna buy that house. So you've gotta be very cognizant. So what's going on with us 
is that all these loan paybacks that are supposed to be happening keep getting slid back, uh, you know, 10 days, two weeks. Now, do we care? Of course we care because we want that money back so we can relend it out. But the biggest problem for you guys in the fix and flip space is that that, that hurts your profitability, right? Because the longer that you hold on to this property, you're paying more on your holding costs. Uh, interest is, is, is accruing. Um, your taxes are accruing, your HOA is accruing, your insurance is accruing. So that affects your profitability. So you guys have got to stay on top of your realtor. You've got to stay on top of the title companies. And you, more importantly, you've got to stay on top of that loan officer. So you have got to be proactive in your transactions. Now, that brings me to the third point in the hard money space is that new loans. I'll talk about new loans. We are still lending. Again, we are still lending. We've always been lending. The reason why we're lending is because we have a private we have a private, we have private capital. This money is basically our money and we make decisions on it. Now, we do make good decisions. Now, one of the things that we're doing on the hard money side is we are only looking at entry level properties. If a property is a two-step property where you might need to sell a property to buy this property, we might take a look, we will take a look at it, but you might get turned down because we are focused on the entry level property space. Now, why are we focused on that? And the reason is, is because our clients that are buying fix and flips, you've got to have a plan B. So if these properties drop dramatically, you've got to be in the position where you might need to turn that thing into a rental for a year or two, and then be in the position to refinance us out because you don't want to keep us out there for more than nine months to a year because we have high interest rates. Let's face it, it's not a surprise. And so you don't want to keep us out there. You want to get rid of us as soon as you can. Um, we're sort of like a uh, we're sort of like a bad stepchild. You got to drop us as soon as you can. Um, hey, Charlie. Yes, ma'am. We have we have a question over here. You know, re regarding you know your relax or relax lending. Um, if if properties are you know if I guess if lenders are are not lending you know as much maybe because of COVID nineteen is that something that we should be you know considering maybe not you know getting into this market is it something that we should shy away from is it not a good time to be you know in the market I'm going to address that from two different standpoints because I'm not sure if it's relying on getting into the fix and flip market or getting into the hard money lending market I'll approach the fix and flip market. Guys, this is the perfect time to be jumping in headfirst. As I spoke earlier about the fix and flip space, it's the perfect storm. You, This is the time to advertise. This is the time to get your name out there. You got to do your campaigns. Now, from the hard money standpoint, again, same kind of thing. This, Again, this is the perfect storm to be out there because if you are into the market like we are and you understand the market, then as far as the entry-level properties, I would, I would go... I would enter the space wholeheartedly, but I would be very conservative. Now, some of the parameters that we're conservative on is two things. We lend on two parameters. We lend on the LTV to the ARV, loan to value of the after repair value. Back in the day, I was going maybe 75% LTV of the ARV, ARV being after repair value, what we think the property is going to be worth fixed up. So we were going 75%, maybe a little bit higher if the property was newer. Now, what we've done is we've cut that back. We're now at 65% to 70% of the ARV. <clears throat> the, more, the more renovation work a property needs, I might go down to 60% LTV ARV. <clears throat> now, the next thing that we lend on is the loan to cost, the LTC. <clears throat> the LTC is a parameter of where <clears throat> it's the added renovation plus the purchase. So we add the purchase to the renovation, we get a number. If you're buying a $300,000 house, you're purchasing it for 180, you got a $30,000 renovation, your loan to cost is 210,000. Where we were lending 95 to 100% of the loan to cost, we are now between 85 to 90% of the loan to cost. So what we have done is we have brought back our parameters to a conservative level. We have made the fix and flip investor put a little bit more capital in the game, not a lot, because if you would compare us to other Hard money guys, we are still king of the hill as far as being, uh, we're, as far as making you guys bring less capital to the table. But with that said, we're focused on entry level property. So I hope that answers your question. That does. There, there's one other question that just came in specifically for Charlie. So I'm going to try to focus this on Charlie. How do you get out of a contract prior to closing date that you put on contract? You can answer at the end if you prefer. But we, we're 
encouraging you to ask questions, you know, as they come up so that we don't have a bunch at the end. So someone's asking about that. How do you get out of a contract prior to closing? You know, that's that's a great question uh, because when you purchase a property in the fix and flip world, it's basically a non-contingent property. And the reason is, is because when you use one of our pre-approval letters, we're basically the same as cash. And so there's never been a deal that we've committed to doing in the contract status that we've never done on our account. Um, because technically, if I like the deal, we're not denying you. There's no reason to deny you. Um, right. it's, it, we're going to close it within 10 days. Yeah. So there's not a long, large window if, on the buy side. Now, right. on, the, on the sell yeah. side, people are getting out of contracts because they're more traditional financing bills. Right. So you don't have a financing contingency when you use us. Um, you're also buying it as is, where is. So unless you've had a five or 10 day inspection clause built into your contract, which, oh, by the way, I would recommend a 10 day inspection clause, because if you have the 10 day inspection clause in there, you can get out based on that. Um, <clears throat> another way of getting out of these contracts is that uh, hopefully you'll get bailed out by the title company. If the pot title company comes back and says the title's not clean, there might be a couple of unreleased deeds of trust or there might be an unreleased lien. Well, that will give you a good way of exiting it as well, but that's more reliant on what the title company's title abstract is going to show. So there's two ways you can get out. Number one, you can get lucky and get bailed out by the title company. And number two, um, there could be some, uh, uh, if you have a 10 day uh, clause in there to do an inspection, then you can get out based on that. So I would just cover yourself and at least put a five day inspection contingency in there, if not a 10 day. But I don't know why you would get out of the contract if you're in it. Hopefully you've done your homework and that you've put in, you know, you know your renovation budget, you know your draw schedule, you know your after repair value. So hopefully you're not going to be surprised. Okay, great. We we got a few questions that just came in about, you know, what type of investors are are you guys working with? Fix and flippers, wholesalers, where do you get your deals? Are you looking at auctions? I think we should wait until maybe the next slide when we start talking about the roadmap. And as we go through the roadmap, maybe you can discuss, you know, those different types of um, revenue streams. Um, can you explain one one thing maybe now? Can you explain what is an entry level property from your perspective? Maybe that's, a, that's a great question. Um, all right. The definition of an entry level property is a, a property that a borrower can purchase without having to sell a house that they're living in. So the entry level property price point depends on where you're located and what general area. So for example, if you're in PG County, for example, uh, an entry level property will go up to about $350,000. It's somebody that's going to be able to purchase that property using an FHA VA loan or a conventional loan, a non-contingent purchase, only contingent on the financing. Now, if you're in, let's say, Petworth in, in D.C., you're in Columbia Heights, the entry-level property might be 650 to 700 because now you're getting a different class of, of, of borrowers out there. Same thing with Montgomery County. You have a different level of entry-level borrowers who have, higher in, have, who have higher income and that can purchase a property without having to sell another property which is a non-home sale contingent purchase. So that's what we're considering entry level property price points. Also too, an entry level property is also considered that if you purchase it and you can't sell it, you're gonna be able to rent it at a certain price point so that doesn't really hamper your cash flow. So you can get into it as a pretty good cash flow on the rental side. It might not meet our thousand times or hundred times rents criteria, but it is another property that you can turn into a rental in case you can't sell it. All right, thank you, Charlie. All right. You want to move on? We, we're getting yeah. some good questions. We're going to try to address some of those questions. Over one, one more aspect of the uh, status of the DMV real estate market. So okay. my next segue is going to be into the commercial sector. I'll cover this pretty quick. Um, what you guys have to understand is that we are primarily on the residential side, but we also have some commercial properties, not only that we do loans on, but that we also own. So I want to touch the commercial se sector a little bit. The first thing that I want to stress is that the commercial segment is going to look entirely different in the next six months to a year. Because people are working from home, the office space segment is at risk. Um, there's going to be another crawl. We've had this crawl into the urban center, 
but the rush to the urban center is going to dramatically slow down. So this COVID environment is going to bring an entirely different change to the office space sector of the commercial space. Less and less office space is going to be needed because employers are going to be saying, hey, I'm getting a lot more availability out of my employees. I'm getting a lot more production out of my employees, and I really like them working at home. So they're going to need less office space. That's going to have a dramatic impact. The next thing that you have to realize is the retail space is under huge pressure. We all know that a lot of segments of this country, including our area, states and areas have been shut down for two months plus. These tenants are having a hard time meeting their rents. Um, I can't tell you what the government is not doing for small businesses. They are not helping small businesses. I go into uh, my, my restaurants to pick up carry out that are not franchise owners, the mom and pop stores, and they cry to me all the time about what's going on and that nobody is helping them out. These guys are going out of business. And it and these guys have been working their businesses for 15, 20 years and nobody's helping them. They don't know how to help themselves because they're working their businesses full time. I can't tell you, I go in, they show me um, cable bills, they go in, they tell me I haven't paid my rent in three months and my landlord is not letting me slide. So you're going to have a huge change in that space as well. So the retail space is under pressure. Um, retail space being both your retail shopping centers, your strip centers, and your big time box, big box shopping centers. Huge pressures. This is going to last for years. Um, the next thing that's under pressure are the apartments. So if you own four units or more, 10, 15, 30, 100 units, and you've got most of your tenants are uh, entry level service employees that are in the restaurant business, Maybe they're bartenders, maybe they're servicers, you know, uh, waitresses, waiters, servicers, um, anybody that was in certain segments of the um, um, construction space, anybody in the hospitality space, these guys have been laid off and they've been laid off for three months. So what that's going to do is that's going to put a lot more burden on the apart apartment owners. Um, so let's focus on some of the good things in the commercial space. Uh, the industrial segment is doing really, really well. Uh, the manufacturing space is doing really, really well. Anything where you need warehouses, anything where you need um, memory banks, uh, they're doing really well. The medical space is doing fairly well. So there are some positive signs to the commercial space. But if you're in the commercial sector, you just have got to be very, very careful. And that will end my portion of the DMV real estate market. And the next slide is we'll talk about um, our roadmap to wealth. Unless there's other questions, Sandra. We've had a number of questions come in related to investing in our funds. So um, what yields are, minimum investments, qualified investors. For those questions, if you'd reach out to me or Charlie directly, that would be most helpful. And we could go over those with you and get you the related fund documentation. There are other questions coming up here. Um, I think as Sandra, you're going through the roadmap, Sam, maybe if you can talk yeah, about, you know, you know, the wholesaling the and, you know, yeah, lead, yeah. lead generation and maybe, okay. you know, your, your hard money lending, things yeah. like that, if you can get sure. into the details. Sure, go okay. ahead. Charlie, you want to talk to the roadmap here? Yeah, I do. I'll talk about, talk through the roadmap. <clears throat> All right. One of the things, we are entering into a new level of our business model uh, and we're entering into a very mature space within our model. And we are creating something called a residential, and I'm gonna I'm quote, this is a Sam Jackman term, so I gotta quote, I gotta quote where it came from. We're entering into what's called the residential real estate investing ecosystem. And we have been working on this for probably a year and a half. And we are gonna create an e matter of fact, we are creating the ecosystem. And what this is, is this is basically the roadmap to wealth in real estate residential investing. <clears throat> and what we're doing is what our goal is, and don't be intimidated by this, please. This isn't to intimidate anybody. I'm just gonna explain to you what we're doing. We're gonna create, and we've already done it, and we're in the process of doing it, is we're gonna create an educational series to move somebody from knowing not much to residual income. As far as we know, we are one of the only folks in this country who are doing this and who are about ready to do it. So basically what we're doing, if you start on the left side, we're, we're creating educational modules as we speak. 
and we're going to have three different sets of which Sam will talk about in more depth in the next few slides. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we have courses and we're going to present the courses to you guys if you want to be in part of it. Um, so for example, if you're a beginner, uh, we're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to teach you uh, how to fix and flip. We're going to teach you how to um, wholesale. We're going to give you uh, a class in residential real estate financing, which is going to, oh, by the way, include hard money. It's going to include a lot of different facets on how to purchase properties to train you how to be a fix and flipper. Um, we're going to go through uh, lead generation, teaching you how to create leads. But at the same time, um, we're also going to create leads for you. So once you've gone through some of these education modules, we want you guys to plug into our Clear Sky Group ecosystem. So the next thing that we're going to do for you is we are going to not only create leads for you, but we are also going to teach you how to fish because we have got to teach you how to fish because at the end of the day, you have got to be able to create your own leads for yourself. But at the same time, we've got a strategic partnership that we're creating today with somebody else that we are also going to have access to something where we're going to create more and more leads. So some of our top students, um, we're going to actually start to uh, hand you leads, leads that you're going to have to go and sort of prove yourself and sort of get this lead to closure. And then we're going to help you with that as well. So the next big phase of this that we're going to do is this lead generation piece. Now, nobody else, okay, nobody else is as good as us at creating leads because we chase leads, we chase distressed properties, we know how to do it. We do it all day, we've been doing it for 15 years. We are really, really good. The next thing that we're doing on the lead creation piece is we're going to have a, uh, a partnership, a strategic partnership to create even more and more leads that we're not going to be able to handle ourselves. So that's where our students come in. So we want our students to be able to have access to those leads as well. Um, again, we're going to help them create leads, but we're also going to teach them how to fish. Now, the third thing that we're doing is if you go up the roadmap, you look at this thing called wholesaling and flipping. Now, you can, you can be part of this roadmap at any point in time, depending upon your level of sophistication. We don't care. If you want to just come and do the education, sit with us and learn, and you want to leave, that's fine. If you want to be part of us from education to residual income, we'd love to have you. So the third part of the roadmap is the wholesaling flipping piece. Remember, we're going to teach you how to generate leads, and we're going to create some leads for you. So the next two things that you can do with these leads, actually, there's three things you can do with these leads. Number one, you can wholesale them, right? So you can make, you know, 20, 30, 10, 20, $30,000 on a wholesale. Fine. Um, we then want you to flip. If you're going to be a, a fix and flipper, well, guess what we're going to do? If we provide you the lead on the flip side, we might want you to use Clear Sky Financial as the hard money lending piece. We already have that in place. Um, so we have the hard money piece in place where, you know, we'll fund the deal for you. Now, once, now the next step to this process is the most powerful part of the process. And that's this thing called the creation of residual income. What does that mean? Well, residual income is just simply income that you're deriving from assets that you own. That's all it is. You might have to touch those assets and keep charge of them. Like for example, we own a rental portfolio. Even though it's considered asset residual income, it's not totally residual income because we have to touch this all the time. We've got people working for us that are actually managing our properties that in turn are helping us create our residual income. Okay, so what are the components of residual income? Number one, fix and flips. I mean, buy and holds. You create a residential rental portfolio. Some people don't wanna do that because they don't wanna be landlords. What's the next step of this residual income? Well, guess what? If we're helping you create income on the wholesale side and the fix and flip side, well, guess what we want you to do with your money? We want you to take that money, 20, 30, 40, 50,000, we want you to put it back into the clear sky funds. We've got two funds. Uh, uh, we have a B fund and a C fund. So if you take that $40,000, you pop it into our funds, we're going to pay you out a monthly interest rate. Guess what? We have just helped you create yet another component of residual income. Okay, let's go down step three, four, five, and six. All right, step three, we might help you buy distressed notes, non-performing notes. Maybe you can add that as part of your portfolio. We might help you figure out tax lien certificate investing. 
pop you in there, right? So there is a lot of different ways that we're gonna help you guys create residual income to the very far right side. So basically what you're looking at is this roadmap to what we call roadmap to financial freedom, which is residual income. You can, you can take any turn you want on this roadmap. You can start anywhere you want on this roadmap. And as, Sam, and as Sam is gonna explain in the next few charts, we will take you through the educational series that we're about ready to launch. Um, and that's the next few slides. Uh, do we have any questions on this before we go to the educational piece? Um, let's see, Charlie, there's one question that did just come in about um, residual income. Would you consider lease options in your residual income portfolio? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a great part. Um, what I would do is I would consider there's two things, right? Number one, lease options. But I would consider lease options as a subset of the buy and hold, right? Uh, the difference between a lease option for the, you guys that don't understand is that a lease option has an actual exit within your buy and hold, a potential exit. So it's it's somebody that can do a lease with the option to purchase. So that option to purchase is out there for the tenant. Um, and that's a good way to keep within your residential uh, portfolio as well. The next thing that you might want to think about doing is, are these subject twos. Um, yeah, contract for deed. Con yeah, subject twos, where you just basically acquire the property, you keep the existing loan out there because that loan might be at a lower interest rate, and then you put a renter in there and you buy and hold it. Now you got to be careful on a subject two because the bank does have a due on sale clause. So you just got to be very careful if you're doing a subject two. Uh, the next thing to do, like Sam just mentioned, uh, is a contract for deed. Um, there's other methodologies within the contract for deed space that you can use for residual income, tie a wrapper around a property, and we'll go through that. But that's more advanced type stuff that we'll do in our Thriver series, which Sam will explain on the next couple of charts. Great. That's a great segue. And thank you, Milton, for that question. It's like you're working with Sam and Charlie. It's hey, Milton. Good to hear about, from you. Good <laughs> would you consider you. subject to then seller financing? So hopefully we answered your question, Milton. All right. Are you ready to move forward, Sam, Charlie? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So taking a look at this chart, what we're seeing is in the pillars of wealth, you see survivors highlighted. And so we're going to talk a little bit about where you are in real estate investing and how that fits in into the roadmap to wealth. So if you're a survivor, that's a person who's focused on earning extra income and learning right now. So you would benefit probably from a fundamentals class. You'd benefit from understanding all of the details associated with closings, of the hangups with closings, of what's needed to get done in order to get them purchase or a sale done. So you have very specific needs. Underneath that, we have laid out a training pathway, a path that you see in the lower right-hand corner. So you'll see the fundamentals of real estate investing. That'll be a three-day class. And you see financing, real estate deals, wholesaling, flip and fix and flip investing. Those are all separate classes that would be very well suitable for someone who's a survivor or even a little further along on the path and wants to get a refresher, go through and pick up unique details. So it, who's going to be a survivor? You have to be thinking in terms of what characterizes you as a survivor on the roadmap to wealth. So you can pick from within our system, our ecosystem, those classes that are meaningful to you and where you want to be, what your goals are. You don't have to go all the way down the roadmap. It's unnecessary. It is designed for you to pick out pieces and become expert on them. So maybe inherited a home and it's uh, one that needs to be redeveloped a bit. How does that fit in? What's your most effective way of maximizing your return and how much time and, and, and resources do you have available to work through it? Do you need to just wholesale out of it or do you, can you go through a renovation process? And what are your financial goals? How are they gonna fit in to your real estate investing goals? Do you need cash like in seven years for your kid's college or do you need cash now? Or maybe you're more interested in wholesaling. And on a longer term basis, a person who's in this survivor, again, on the pillars on the left side of the chart, you'll see survivor. That is a person who does not seek immediate uh, residual income. That would be a much longer term plan for them. So going to the next slide, we're going to look at the center column. It's the planner. And the planner, you see highlighted there, their goal is 
that they want to avoid losses in their real estate portfolio and they want to grow a small net worth into a larger one. So they want to um, have a training pathway that's somewhat more sophisticated uh, than the survivor pathway. They're going to look at more buy and hold investing. They're going to look at more distressed asset purchases in depth, such as in say a, sur say a, a survivor might consider their first flip a very basic paint and carpet kind of flip. This person moving into this more sophisticated uh, flipping business would be interested in, in maybe doing a permanent addition on a property or um, even um, considering adding a next level or something that requires permits, more, uh, more public service involvement where you're gonna have to get uh, street permits and things like that to, to do work. So that would be fixed and flip investing too, and distressed assets. How do how that person is going to go out and find distressed assets on their own? Maybe using one of our methods that we've outlined to canvas neighborhoods or look for uh, distressed assets in in the legal listings and and so forth. So finally, we're moving now towards the the thriver. And Sandra, if you flip to the thriver, that's a person who's already got a real estate portfolio outlined. How they're going to to either have the tax lien income or they're going to have uh, buy and hold income and they have a much more sophisticated view of the uh, real estate marketplace. They may be doing condo conversions or um, breaking up parcels or things like that. So this, this person's going to be further along in the real estate, in the real estate life cycle. We'll be addressing uh, those later in our coursework. So what's going on with our coursework? Um, we had initially thought that this would be strictly a DMV region event that we would have, and we were laying this out prior to COVID. And uh, most recently, we have uh, changing our view on this somewhat. We're gonna do a mixed approach where we're going to have a classroom instruction, and then we're gonna also have remote learning all and uh, make that available to a broader or audience, both regionally and uh, you know across the nation that they can tune in. So we'll have the live interaction of people in a classroom, but we'll also have some online components as well. While we lay that, while we're laying, still laying that out, we're looking at tools to do that. Right now, what we're planning on doing is setting up a forum similar to this, except one where by we will see all of the participants and we'll all interact among one another. Uh, we do about 10, 10 people and we're gonna do one day uh, one full day, it's going to be the fundamentals class uh, compressed. So we're going to be do it's be a dry run, test run of our fundamentals coursework, and that is coming up. Sandra, the next slide I think specifies it's uh, coming up on June 4th. Is that what we said? Yes, yes, that's what we said. Sam, as, yeah. as you're talking about this, we're getting uh, quite a few questions about okay. you know, coursework now that you've talked about it. Um, they want to know where we're located, um, where, where Clear Sky is based, and where will the classes be offered? Um, what are the costs for the classes? Um, I guess those are the two questions related to education so far. Those are great questions. So uh, Charlie and I are in Northern Virginia. We do business in Northern Virginia, and the Washington DC and Maryland, uh, licensed broker in all those jurisdictions and uh, we do our own fix and flips there. Uh, we fund deals uh, primarily in those areas, although we have done some uh, funding as well uh, in, in North Carolina. So uh, our initial class, as I was just mentioning, our, our dry run is just going to be a virtual one. When we set up the in-person in ones, we're anticipating doing it in Northern Virginia, probably in Arlington or somewhere where we can have accessible driving for people coming from Maryland, DC, and so forth, who want to uh, all, all join us uh, uh, over the course of a few days. Okay, um, one question, is there a strategy to create a furnished residential portfolio that rents on a month-to-month -month basis? I know it's I mean, not that related would be more to of the Airbnb model. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, well. Well, the Airbnb model has been trashed by this COVID event. Um, yeah, it was a month to month basis might refer to more to employee housing. I did hear of a deal yesterday in the city where they're uh, taking a condo 
conversion and they're doing uh, about 20 units that are month to month and then they they're going to sell off 10 units so i have heard of those deals going on but i am we're not participating in any of them right now mm -hmm. yeah we're not doing anything like that now there was a question from Brittany that wants to understand the 100 times rents criteria for those of you that, that do not know um it's it's it, there's two things it's either 100 times rents which i like that better and then there's the rule of one percent um, of the price what this refers to is when you buy a residential property and you put it in your buy and hold portfolio basically what it says is that if the rents are two thousand dollars a month our rule of thumb is we like to keep the purchase price at about 200 grand plus any renovation and upkeep so that's like a rule of thumb so if my per if i could purchase it at 170 to 220 230 if i'm close to that 100 times rents then we will purchase it and pop it into our buy and hold portfolio now some of you guys are saying, don't you guys realize that this is a very expensive place to live in? We get it. So the problem with that strategy in this area is it probably doesn't work too well in Fairfax County, Arlington, Alexandria City, some parts of DC, but Montgomery County, where it does work really well right now is some parts of Prince William, certainly Fredericksburg, Stafford, Charles County, um, parts of uh, PG County, it's working. Uh, it works in the Baltimore area, but the Baltimore area is a little bit different strategy. I don't know that I would do 100 times rents. I would probably do, I'd probably be a little bit more aggressive up there just to make sure that your cash flow is a lot better up there. Um, and the other thing that you need to be very wary of is that if you're going to go by the 100 times rents rule, it's very important that you buy into an area. Number one, you buy into equity, right? And then number two, you buy into an area where you think is going to have future appreciation. Now, we never bank on future appreciation. Future appreciation is just the icing on the cake, but that's kind of our rule of thumb. So I hope I've explained the 100 times rent rule well enough. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we'll get to some more questions. I think I'm assigning them to you and Sam, so if you guys can kind of go through. I think we've talked through most of the questions, at least at a high level. Let's, let's Sam, are you finished with the um, Thriver profile? We can. Yeah, please move to the next slide. Okay. So Sam, Sam alluded to this, and I think so did Charlie. So we, we are looking to um, pilot a session on the fundamentals of real estate investing. So all of the courses that you just heard from Sam um, are, are, are either developed or being developed, but we want to kind of get some people in front of them to see, you know, how they how they work in front of someone uh, or, or some potential investors. And we want to see how that will work, you know, online as opposed to in person. We were definitely thinking we would have some pilot classes in person starting in June, but COVID uh, kind of changed our plans. So we're looking to, uh, you know, host a, a pilot session next Thursday or next, next Thursday in two weeks, Thursday on June 4th from 9.30 to 4:30, and we're looking for some participants who are willing to you know set aside you know a full day to work with us um, on on you know kind of listening and, and asking questions so if you're interested we're going to send out an email after this webinar and with a survey in it and we'll select about 10 uh, participants from the email that we send out so what we're looking for is for you to be available you should have reliable access to the internet we want to make sure that you are available via webcam so we do want to see your faces um, like Charlie and Sam sitting there and not me um, and we want to make sure that you're willingly um, going to participate and actively ask questions so we need feedback on the content you know are is it too fast too slow are you getting what you need so we can tweak classes if we need to so the survey will be sent out after this webinar let's see yeah let me address one more question that somebody asked um, regarding the cost we have not established the cost. Sandra, if, if you can go back, can you go back to the roadmap? Yes. Please, so I can explain this a little bit better. So for our first class, there's certainly no cost. We'll yeah, we haven't established the cost, but what you guys have got to understand and realize that we're, we're not trying to sell an overnight, get quick scheme class and charge you outrageous amounts of money. That is not our intent. That's never been our intent. As a matter of fact, we could have done this years ago and people would have came and paid us for it. We get it. That's not the focus of our business. I don't know that that's ever gonna be the focus, but 
What we see a need for out there is people need to educate other people who are actually doing these. And so we feel strongly that we want to educate you guys from the perspective of not only giving you knowledge, book smart knowledge, but I tell you right now, we, we have a lot of street smart knowledge and we feel we could do just as good a job as anybody else. But our premise is not to make money off the educational thing. But then again, it's we're not going to, you know, we're not going to lose money. So if we can break even, we're happy because what we want to do is we want to, we're trying to create this, well, which we already have created. We want you guys to go through our entire ecosystem, as Sam would say. And so that to us is a lot more important. Um, if I could take somebody who knows absolutely nothing in real estate and I could get them to maybe own one or two residential uh, buy and holds in let's say a year or two years time, then that's worth a lot more to us than a bunch of money. So what you have to realize is that our cost isn't going to be a lot, but we do have to put a little bit of cost on there because you do got to pay for something because we can't give it away for free or else you wouldn't, you wouldn't take any value out of it. So I just want to approach that topic and we'll, we'll come out with it. We're working on it. All right. The other thing is for, for the, um, the I guess the pilot session fundamentals we the fundamentals course is, is actually you know intended to be a three-day course so in one day of course you're not going to get all three days so it's a con very condensed course we're not going to go through everything that we would go through in a three-day you know in-person course so we also realize that that you know it is offered you know free of charge but it will be a very condensed course and you know we will be very interactive it's not going to be like you're sitting there just to you know get all the educational components we're trying to get something from you as well so hopefully you'll be willing to help us out with that sam did you want to talk about anything on that side before I move forward no I'm okay. good thank great you. thank you all right let's see I don't see any more questions all right there was a thank you a lot of you know thank you for the session I'm gonna move forward again again just to reiterate you're gonna get a survey and it's going to inquire as to whether you're interested in participating in the one day uh, online seminar and i'm getting some texts on my phone messaging about people who are interested just let us know uh where you are in the in, on the roadmap where what what your goals are and uh, what you've done in real estate and we'll be working looking forward to working with you right yeah and the other thing uh if you don't mind that we would like to get feedback on is is number one is this helpful especially the market updates is it helpful and then number two more importantly how often all right do you want us to continue to do it and then more importantly how often do you want us to continue to do it because the most important thing about this market is that we are in uncharted territories and we will continue to be in uncharted territories for at least the next year it could go on for two years three years and so we are constantly on top of this market so if you want us to do it every two weeks we'll be glad to do it if you want us to do it once a month we'll be glad to do it we don't want to do overkill. I don't want you to see our face every day of the week. That might be overkill. But so number one, do you like it? Number two, is it helpful? And number three, how often do you want us to do it? Because we don't mind doing it because this is our business. Uh, we know the market in and out. If the market turns for the worst, trust me, we'll let you know and we'll know it. Um, we'll see it. Um, and so we would like that kind of feedback too. Thank you. Okay, we got lots of very helpful you know, um, messages coming through. Um, yes, the market the market updates are very helpful. Um, thank you for this. Um, someone asked if you can just briefly talk about the wholesale market. We do have a few more minutes left. So can you talk about the status of wholesale markets during the, these times? Yeah, I'll, I'll cover it if you don't mind, Sam. Um, sure, go ahead. We, okay, uh, February and before, we were in an absolute wholesale rodeo. Well, the rodeo has come to an end. What I mean by that is that the wholesalers were trying to wholesale properties and just make extraordinary wholesale fees. And they weren't leaving enough skin on the bone for the fix and flip investors. Now, you guys that are trying to wholesale, there are, there are some fix and flip investors, but what you have to understand, the guys that have been overbuying and that are making tight margins, what you have to understand, these guys who are one, onesies and twosies kind of buyers, they're not buying right now because they're finally realizing that when I overbuy from a wholesaler, my profit margin is very, very small. So what's going on now is there's a good opportunity 
to acquire wholesale properties. But what I'm seeing is that the wholesale fees aren't as big as they used to be. Maybe something where you might have a $30,000, $40,000 wholesale fee. I'm seeing it's probably in the ten dollars to $15,000 range. Uh, we purchased a wholesale three weeks ago and our the wholesale fee was $5,000. So what you wholesalers have got to understand is that you just get a good deal in there, leave some skin on the phone for that fix and flip investor so that you have a, 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 a buyer that's gonna be a repeat buyer because it's more important for you guys to pick up repeat buyers than it is to, for you to pick up a, you know, a fix and flipper who's doing their first fix and flip that overpays for the property. So that's kind of what's going on. Now, from the wholesale standpoint, now is the time to increase your advertising dollars. You can't sit on the sideline because there's going to be a lot of opportunity as this economy changes on the residential side, as prices maybe start to trickle down, you're going to see more frantic sellers. So there's a, there's a good perfect storm out there right now. It, it's going to last at least another three or four months. The next thing that we cannot predict is what's going to happen in October and November, because keep in mind, guys, we are in an election cycle. No doubt about it. Not only are we in an election cycle, but we're in an election cycle in a pandemic. It hasn't happened. So you've got to key in, right? You've got to keep your ears to the, to the, to the, to the tracks. Um, the next thing that's going to happen, and you've got to keep your eye on it. Remember, the people that normally would have sold this spring, they haven't sold. They need to sell. So they're either, they're either going to put their property on the market in September, October, election cycle, or they're going to come back next spring. So we, we are eventually going to be flooded with inventory. Now, the next thing that I'm hearing is that, oh, there's going to be a big foreclosure of this, foreclosure of that. Guys, don't count on it because the government is going to postpone these foreclosures like they're already doing. <laughs> the servicers are going to start doing what's called forbearances. So what's going to end up happening is we're not going to see a huge foreclosure boom. We're going to see increased inventory. But remember, the big thing that you got to keep an eye on are those spring retail sellers that, that we're going to sell in the spring that aren't here. They're going to be here maybe in October, September, and they're certainly going to be here next spring. And so that's going to flood the market with inventory. So, again, this thing is, is, is going along the tracks. We don't know where it's going to turn. Right now it's great. Charlie, we have two more questions I think we can maybe squeeze in if we get quickly. Um, so as a flip and fix investor, how should we approach a rehab property in today's market conditions, which are longer project with major rehab, or should we go with a shorter rehab project? Shorter rehab project. No, no question. I would go with the shorter rehab. Matter of fact, uh, for us in the hard money space, anything that's nine months out, six, seven, eight months out, nine months out, from being on the market, condo conversions that aren't shovel ready, don't take it personal, we're not touching it. Because our crystal ball doesn't go out that far. My crystal ball right now is only going three months, June, July, August. And then I've got to wait for June to come, July to come before my crystal ball goes any further out. Right now it's three months. Maybe when I get into July, it might compress to two months. So my our suggestion to you, fix and flip space, number one, entry level number two a light renovation what's light mean not a full gut maybe a you know forty thousand to fifty thousand dollar renovation something that you can churn and burn in four to six weeks get it on the market one way um, to think about your renovation cost is you should be making as much as you pay for the renovation cost and the reason that is is the renovation cost is a reflection of the complexity of it so if it's twenty thousand dollars to renovate a house, you're just talking about carpet paint and some appliances. It's not too complicated. So you can afford to have a thinner margin there. You get into a $50,000 renovation, you're redoing all the bathrooms. This is a longer process. You'll have permits. You'll have other complexities. You need to get paid more for it. Try it. Try to keep in, the, keep in parallel with the cost of the renovation, the renovation costs with your profitability. Yeah, and, 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 and that brings up another point. Um, in that for us and for you fix and flip purchasers, even wholesale purchasers, unfortunately, you have either got to purchase vacant properties or you had better have in ironclad stone when that occupant is leaving. Obviously, when you buy it on the closing date, simple, make sure it's vacant. Um, if they need to stay another month, then you need to have either a nice ironclad pre-set or post-settlement occupancy agreement 
where you take their money if they stay past that 30 days. And if they're not willing to move out, you would better have a keys for cash in place because for us on the hard money side, under no circumstances are we lending on an occupied property, bottom line. Uh, we had a deal that was supposed to go out, um, I'll say the street name, it was on Whittier. Uh, it was supposed to close. We knew that there was a tenant in there. Uh, Sam drove by it, guess what? The tenant was still in there. We were supposed to close that day. We did not fund it. We're still gonna do the deal, but we're only gonna do the deal when that tenant is out of there because the purchaser does not have a keys for cash in place and you have a tenant in there. Now, if you buy a property that's occupied with a tenant in there and you're gonna fix and flip, good luck. Because right now the courthouses are closed. Right, no and in DC, in DC especially, uh, good luck. One year, one year to get out of tenant. And that's if they're not elderly and that's if they're not handicapped. So again, you gotta make sure the property is vacant or if it's not vacant, you've got to know when it's gonna be vacant. I can't stress to you how important that is in this space. Okay, we are a couple of minutes over and some people have started to drop already. Um, there, there was one other question I kind of wanted to get to. Someone was asking about Section 8. Are you guys, you know, doing any Section 8, you know, lending? Is that a good market to be in or not, especially in some of the inner city areas like Baltimore, maybe? So the uh, question is if we're doing Section 8, lending on Section 8 rental properties? or Section 8 rental I, properties, is okay, that something so, that you would be? So I, in terms of our rentals, we will accept Section 8 uh, tenants. Uh, of course, they're going to have uh, normal screening processes for their finances, and uh, the, they're going to need to have demonstrated income to to meet the voucher. I mean, to meet the rents, whether it's a voucher income or in DC, you can't you can't dis discriminate against people with uh, sources of income, but you can evaluate the reasonableness of their ability to pay. Like, if the voucher pays only 50%, they have to pay the balance. They're going to have to have credit and employment that supports that. So so we're open to that to voucher programs in terms of our lending business. When we lend to a person who's doing a buy and hold, they can put a voucher tenant in the property, but then they're going to replace out our, our financing thereafter once they've stabilized that property. So for us it wouldn't it wouldn't be an issue at all, any kind of voucher uh, issue. Great. Thank right. You. And, a, and a big part of that is you got to be careful right now. I can't stress how careful you got to be. Once the property is performing with a Section 8 tenant, your ability to refinance us out is not there right now. It's coming back because the secondary market for 30 year rentals has disappeared for two and a half months. Now I'm starting to see signs of it trickling back. Um, and we're getting uh, other lenders, national lenders that are bringing their 30 year product back. But again, it's very expensive right now. So the normal days of where you could go and refinance, a refinance out a 30 year lender with Velocity or somebody else and get a pretty good rate, mm, gotta be careful. Um, yeah, but that's so, not specific to vouchers. That's to all rentals when you're doing- That's all rentals. When you're doing the buy and hold strategy and you're using us to stabilize the property. Yeah, because like I said earlier, you want you, you if you're gonna use us for a buy and hold strategy, you gotta be able to get rid of us sooner than later. And so it's very important that once the month six or seven happens, you can get the property reappraised. Your credit's got to be strong. And so, um, you know, you got to be able to get us refinanced out. Now, the next strategy that you might that you might need to do is get, if, especially if you're going to do buy and holds, Section 8 or not, get a nice relationship with a community bank. So if you're doing Section 8s up in Baltimore, you know, one of the banks that you can maybe look at is Revere Bank. Uh, but you need to look at a community bank so that they'll give you what's called a buy and hold line so that you could refinance this stuff out with a, with a normal commercial loan from a com community bank. That's probably your second best alternative from going with a normal 30 year. Um, That'll get you a five year product, something that's stable and that you'll renew. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, why don't we go ahead and close up the the you know, the formal session uh, of this webinar and just thank Charlie and Sam for an informative, se informative session and Thanks, hopefully, Sam. you know, kind of whet your appetite for, you know, the, the Clear Sky education and the Clear Sky roadmap and all of the services that Clear Sky can provide you um, along the roadmap to um, wealth. 
um, whether you're surviving or, or thriving, you know, there, there's something here for you. And, you know, these guys can provide, you know, services throughout. Um, Sam and Charlie can be reached at their email addresses that are showing on the screen. And we are also going to send this out, uh, an email out after the webinar with their addresses in it. This webinar was recorded. So if you want to, you know, refer to it, it will be available on the, on the Clear Sky website. More information will be provided in the email that's sent out. And don't forget to complete the survey that we will send out if you're interested in, in being a part of the um, pilot fundamentals of real estate investing course that we are going to host in a couple of weeks. Um, we, we'd appreciate your feedback. So any information that you want to provide us on, you know, additional webinars, it looks like, you know, maybe biweekly folks are saying um, for webinars would be great. Um, so we, if you want to add that to your survey, you know, let us know and we will definitely consider that. Um, if there's nothing else, I know that Sam and Charlie have been receiving the questions, so I don't think that we've left too many on the table. Um, if you want to hang around after you can, there's still about, you know, 80 people on the call. And, you know, there was a couple of questions that came in at the last minute. So if you want to look at those, cash for keys, and then, you know, um, does the election cycles affect your real estate sales? So anyone that, you know, we've kind of formally, oh, you know, in the, in the discussion, but we have. Yes. Yeah, people can drop off if they want, but you ask those questions to us. I'm not seeing them on my screen here. Uh, okay. Cash for keys um, can you explain what cash for keys means? Sure. Oh, so, keys, for, uh, keys for cash, sorry. Keys for cash. <laughs> uh, it just depends on which angle you're looking at it from. So if you're in a home and uh, you are a tenant or you're a prior owner and someone else comes in to buy it, like us or one of our investors who borrowed money from us, those people that those people who are in the home situated they they need some way to get to their next place they need some financial assistance generally and in order to do that the new buyer even though the tenant may have defaulted or the, you know, the old owner defaults on their old loan they need some money to get moving down the road it's a lot easier to come to an economic agreement say in 30 days we'll give you a thousand dollars and 45 days will give you $750. To come to some agreement, it could even be $10,000, depending on your jurisdiction and the complexity of an eviction. So you come to a mutual agreement and then you pay them the money upon their move out. Uh, you don't pay it to them in advance of that, but then they surrender the property free, freely to you and sign off that they have no tenancy rights and so forth. Yeah, I have a great, I have a great, I have a great story. Uh, and, this, and this happened in March. Um, Bought a property at the courthouse steps, uh, got a great deal on it. Um, I was one of the only bidders. Uh, and it was occupied, uh, and, and, and unit, uh, townhouse, main cell code to be exact. And I wasn't sure if it was occupied with the old owner or a tenant. Um, and so I went there three times in the COVID world. You know, I had my gloves on. I don't wear a mask, but I have my gloves on and left a occupant note to the occupant. And the, and the occupant note basically gives them you know, three options. Um, number one, they can continue to rent from us if they're a tenant. Number two, if they're the owner or the tenant, they can buy it from us. Obviously the owner can't buy it from us, but maybe their family member can buy it from us. Actually it's four options. Number three, we'll do a keys for cash, which will give them money for their keys. And then number four, you're gonna get evicted. Those are the four options. So I had to go there three times because I wasn't sure who was there. I met a young lady one time I was there and I still wasn't sure if it was the owner or tenant, but finally the person, the occupants reached out to me um, and I, and we figured out that he was a sort of tenant. I don't know if you call him a tenant, but he was supposedly paying rent to somebody, not to the owner. So he wasn't paying rent. I found this out later. Um, and so, I had to offer him a three-step keys for cash. And so what we do on the keys for cash is we'll say, okay, we'll say, if you move out, in this case I did, if you move out in 15 days, which it was the middle of uh, middle of March or middle of April, I forgot. Uh, I think at this point in time, it was like the middle of April. So I said, if you move out by the end of April, we'll give you two grand. If you move out in 30 days, uh, May 15, we'll give you 1,500. If you move out at the end of whenever, we'll give you 1,000. Well, surprising to me, this guy jumped on the 15-day $2,000 cash option. And so I can't tell you how happy we were because remember, courthouses are closed. 
this guy would have held us out six months to a year because you can't evict, you can't even file new evictions. So we ended up giving him a two thousand dollar keys for cash, just to find out that not only was he not paying rent to the landlord for at least six months to a year, he was hijacking water from the water company. So he diverted the the water from the main into the house. So he was getting free water, and then he was borrowing his neighbor's utility. So he was stealing utilities from his neighbors. So when we got the property, of course, it was all jacked up, needs a full renovation, and so. That's a story of something that just happened to us recently. So we cannot emphasize more how a keys for cash environment or deal is much more beneficial to both sides. It's a win. Yeah, you're not looking for a super clean house or everything in order. It's win -win. You're just looking for them to surrender all their rights and, and get out of the property. Right. And, and, and on that, and on that note, I'll tell you another story. We're in full stories. You can ask questions, I'll tell stories. I've got a property I own with my brother up in Potomac, Maryland. And this lady has been paying rent. We've had it, we've had it rent out for 10 years. And this lady has been paying us rent for 10 years. She stopped paying in March. So I'm like, Andy, don't take it personal. We've got to get her the hell out. We need to do a keys for cash with her because she lost her job. Something's going on. There's got to be something that we can help her with. Let's move her on so she can move back in with her family. Get our feet on the ground. Well, um, end of May, we haven't even approached her with the keys for cash. So it goes both ways. We haven't received March. We haven't received April. We haven't received May. Nor have we put a, you know, uh, a, a palm out there, a peace offering to her. And so we're sitting here idle. And so that absolutely irritates me. But again, it goes on both sides. You do it or you don't. And if you don't do it, they're going to hang you out. And so anyway. Normal issues. Other questions come up, Sandra? I think there was just one other question on the real estate, um, I guess, market being affected by election cycles. Like, do you see anything? Is it specific to D.C.? Is there anything different about investment cycles during real estate? I mean, during um, election. Yeah. So, in a, uh, I'm going to characterize this in a normal election cycle. Sam, how many have we been through? Five? Is this our fifth one? I think this sure. is our sixth. Wait a minute. Well, it'll be our sixth one, right? Because we've been around for almost 20 years. So back in 2000 was our first four, eight, okay, whatever it is. We've seen the same thing every election cycle. What happens is the, the, the residential market comes to a, a mini stall. Uh, and usually it's between October, usually till January. Martin Luther King Day, because you have Thanksgiving and Christmas thrown in there. So what happens is that the buyers stop buying because everybody is unsure with an administrative change what's going to happen. I'm not saying there's going to be an administrative change, but there's a good chance that there's going to be. And so people take a step back because they're nervous. They're not sure what's going to end up happening. So in an election year, what happens is two things. Number one, people that buying slows down because they're unsure and, and their consumer confidence sort of wavers a little bit. So they're unsure. When people are unsure, they stop buying. So the, so the market takes a mini halt. So inventory isn't going to move as much. So you're going to have to project three, four, five months into maybe getting out of a property than you would normally project. So you got to project maybe a higher holding cost. The next thing that always happens in an election year is that interest rates will continue to be low. The reason is, is the current administration has a lot of incentive to keep interest rates low because that usually spurs the economy. That's a good thing. Now, in this particular case, you have low interest rates. We have an election year, but we also have what we think is probably going to be the middle course of the pandemic. It's certainly not the beginning, and we don't think it's certainly going to be the end. So for us, once October comes along, actually for us, once um, August comes around, we are going to tread a little bit more conservatively than we are right now. Not that we're going to put a stop on our business, but we're going to be very conservative and very careful and just keep an eye on the mar market factors. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Sam, do you have anything else on that? No, I think you got it. Okay. All right. I think that's it. We have one more question about when we'll select the, the 10 participants um, for the, the pilot training. I think that the, that's a good, good question. We're going to send out the survey today. If we can get responses back by, you know, maybe Monday, 
you know, COB, which is, you know, midnight on Monday. Um, we, we can, you know, kind of go through and, and have a, a selection by like Tuesday. I know that you guys may need to clear schedules or something in order to participate. Does that sound good to you, Sam and Charlie? Maybe by Tuesday, yeah. if we can get yeah, those yeah. circles people completed. Are, people are already emailing and texting as we speak, uh, requests to participate, so that's nice. Yeah, you know, if we can if we can fit in more, which we've never done it before, uh, let's look to fit in some more. The more, the better. Um, I just don't know what the experience is going to be like, and see, because one of the things that we want to do, and it's very important for us, and we have these in our uh, team meetings, I want to be able to see everybody's faces, and that's really important because I need to know if they're paying attention, if they're bored. Um, and more importantly, though, we need to understand if they have like the glaze over their eyes, which is where they don't really uh, they hear what you're saying, but they don't understand what you're saying. So if we need to go back and re-explain something, that's that's pretty important. That's why at the very beginning um, we chose or we wanted to do this in person so that we had an audience of 10, 15, 20, 30 people and that we were in front of a room. And so we want it to be a little bit more interactive because it's very important that when you guys have interactive presenters, obviously you're going to be able to get the material. Anybody can go ahead and memorize material. But the important thing that we bring to the table is that we have a lot of stories. And so the examples and the stories are going to probably teach you just as much as the actual coursework. So we feel that it's much better for us to do it in person. But because we're not in that environment, it's okay. We'll deal with it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, everybody, for helping and participating. That's good questions. Yeah, thank you guys for attending. Um, Sandra, thank you very much. This isn't simple, and so we appreciate you guys attending. It means a lot. All righty. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.